I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about eating disorders in general and what they're about because it's not always about this, like you said, this perception or this trying this goal of looking a certain way. I didn't ever want to look like a white woman. <laughs> that was never ever my goal. It was a coping mechanism. It is what I used to help myself when I felt anxious, afraid, um, insecure, out of control, just um, not good enough. I used that that coping mechanism. And I thought I had mastered it. I thought I was really great at this thing. And that was my go-to. You know, I, I lost my um, my mother when I was a child, when I was really young, and that changed my life. And I think, you know, as a result of that, that trauma, I became obsessed with having control as well. You know, you took away my security, you took away my rock. And it was just like, now I felt like I had to be in control of everything. And I became obsessed with that. I think that big misconception about eating disorders is out there already. But then when you come and you present in, in a black body, and if you also don't come in a body that what they feel an eating disorder body should look like, if you're not really, really small or really, really thin, then also you're going to be overlooked or the fears you're going to be overlooked or even just not believe. You know, I talk about this in my book. I remember like just being at the height of my eating disorder. I was in New York. I was on the subway. I picked up the Village Voice. Um, and on the back, it said, if you are struggling with an eating disorder, we can help you. And it was a pilot program that they were doing at one of the major hospitals. And I just remember feeling like, oh my God, I need this. And I you know, called and I went through intake and I went to this program and they were doing... Um, um, there was like therapy and placebos and medicaid like you didn't know if you got the placebo or if you got like the medication mm -hmm. and I remember at one point being in this little office with this therapist person or this like person in charge of the study and people like crowding into the doorway because I was a and I realized oh I'm a black woman and and I'm an oddity the reason I wrote like not all black girls know how to eat is because when I was struggling with an eating disorder, I'm a, I'm a writer, so I'm a voracious reader. So I just read one white girl story after another, right? Like I grew up food insecure. That wasn't in any of the books, mm. right? Um, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about my actual journey to having an eating disorder and recovering from an eating disorder. I didn't want to start my book, um, with an eating disorder. I wanted to start my book in, in childhood where I feel like that was the, the kind of, um, breeding ground for me to have an eating disorder. I had been sick most of my life. I mean, all through adolescence, through my teen years and, and on into my early 20s. And, you know, during that time, I had, you know, it wasn't until probably later on into my 20s where I actually started to quote unquote look like someone with an eating disorder when I had lost a significant amount of weight. And, but I had still been using behaviors all that time. You know, um, I'm a Jamaican American woman and I have like, I, you know, I, <laughs> a lot of women in my family, we don't like, we could be track stars. Like we're, we're muscular. I tend to, you know, build, hold on to some weight because I can hold on to muscle. I've always been athletic. And so because my body has always been athletic, no one associated that with an eating disorder, specifically with anorexia. So I remember going to my doctor, lovely, lovely man who happens to be a white man. He had treated my entire family most of my life. And when I started to lose a lot of weight, he was like, oh, whatever you're doing, keep up the good work. And I remember that day I was going to tell him, I think something's wrong. There's a lot of shame attached to having an eating disorder, to being a black woman and having an eating disorder. Cause you're like, I'm supposed to be strong. Like it's my birthright, right? Like, like I'm, so when you fall outside of that archetype, the strong black woman, the I can do it on my own, the, you know, sisters are doing it for themselves then you don't know where to go. There's nowhere to go. The message that I want people to walk away from, from our conversation or just to, especially people who are treating people with eating disorders, especially if someone comes to you who is a, 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 a non-white 
woman from a middle class background? What do I want them to know? And I think, you know, you touched on this really eloquently. It's just like really just listening and allow them to be heard. And then, you know, I also want to just, you know, give a shout out to Annette too, because, you know, we have our inclusive care initiatives that we're really moving forward with, including our inclusive care guide, which is really a guide for treatment providers to really understand how to, it sets guidelines for really knowing how to treat BIPOC and people from the LGBTQ plus community and people with disabilities and people in larger bodies, you know, because just like you said, we all have different experiences. We all deserve to be heard. We all deserve to be treated with respect and then for that and for that treatment to also be customized to our unique experiences. Uh, so I think that's a really great place to start. And then we also have our BIPOC support group, which meets on Thursdays at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'm one of the facilitators for the group. And we have people come in from all different walks of life, all you know, people of BIPOC, of course, and we're coming together and our experiences are so diverse. But one of the things we have in common is that we can come and we feel safe in that space to talk about being you know, someone in a different body looking different from what people think someone with an eating disorder looks like and being heard and being able to be supported. So, I mean, I think that we're trying to do the work to make sure that, you know, your what you experience and what I experience doesn't happen anymore. And hopefully, you know, I do pray that no one has to deal with the eating disorder. And, you know, at some point that won't be a thing anymore. But if it is a thing, people know they can get help and they know they can feel safe getting that help. 